I uh, have a few announcements to make before we get started. The most exciting of which is that Sister Sheridan Hudson got baptized Saturday night. We we're very thankful for that and we welcome her to the family of God. Uh, we have our uh, school supply initiative going on back there in the back. We appreciate everybody that's participating in that. And we already got probably at least a dozen or so back there. Anyway, appreciate your efforts in that regard. Um, we have a bunch of people traveling. We want to keep them in their prayers. Carpenters, clerks, and uh, carters. And keep Sister Karen Metz in your prayers. Carolyn Snyder, Brother Paul, Jill Edwards, and uh, Roberta Piggy in your prayers also. Uh, we're sad to announce that uh, Christina's mother, Eleanor, passed away Thursday morning, and they will be receiving uh, visitors on August 16th from 5 to 8 at uh, Vaughn's Kimes Funeral. And also, and we need to keep in mind uh, Sister Rhonda's uh, family, her sister Carla, her son-in-law, Keith Nasworthy, passed away, also unexpectedly. Do any other announcements need to be made concerning the sick or anything at all? Uh, my sister-in-law is sick. She's in and out. Now she's 81 years old. And she's going to therapy, she leaves, she's gone to school a little bit. She goes to Mary Adams for a reason. Um, sister-in-law? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, this evening, the order of worship will be a little bit different. Uh, Brother Mark will be leaving soon. Stacy will bring the reading. Uh, Brother Ed is going to leave some prayer. And Patrick will be in charge of communion. I'll turn it over to Brother Mark. First song this evening will be 598. 598. As I journey here mid the toes and tears, there's a rainbow.
chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in a time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he had appointed heirs, heirs of all things, through wisdom, or through whom also he made the worlds. so thankful for this day of life that you give us today. Thank you for all the beautiful weather that we've had and just an honest way of the wonderful life that we do, Father. And we ask, Father, that you'll be with uh, all those who are on our prayer list, tend to the needs of those who need your help, and to be your will, help those who are sick, and be with those who are suffering through the loss of loved ones, and give them a uh, uh, hug, Father, and comfort them in the way only you can do. Be with the teacher tonight, Father, and, uh, that always have a good memory of things he wants to say, and let him say it in a way that we'll all be able to understand it and be able to use it in our daily lives. Be with us as we go through this week, and uh, deliver us away from the uh, temptations that we'll face, and help us when we make decisions, and uh, we pray, Father, that everything that we do will be done in a way pleasing to you. And we know, Father, that we need to come to you to, for your advice when we need the help to make these decisions. And we thank you, Father, so much for your son Jesus and his willingness to come to earth as he did and suffer on the cross so that we would have a chance for eternal life. And it's through Jesus' holy name that we pray. Hannah told me. I can't uh, apparently read my own list, but anyway. <clears throat> 371. I would like to tell you what I think of Jesus, since I found in him a friend so strong and true. I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared. No one ever cared for me 
like to mark your books. Good evening. <laughs> it is good to see each and every one to end this Lord's Day worshiping together in spirit and truth. If you have your Bibles, please open to Hebrews chapter 1. We'll be looking at that this evening. Hebrews, the first chapter. God in various times and various ways. It's an interesting opening to the book of Hebrews. It's different really than almost 
well, any book in the New Testament and almost any book in the Bible. If Paul would write a book, Paul would say, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, or Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, or something similar to that. And, and that he did in, in many of the books he wrote, or almost all the books he wrote, I, he identified himself in the first sentence or first phrase of the book. Here we don't see a, a signature. For a matter of fact, the only signature that we might see is in the second to last verse where it says uh, that it seems to be writing from Italy. And, and so, but there's no signature of who writes this book. So we really don't know. And that's a little bit about the mystery about the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is written to a people that you would know. It's written to a Jewish audience at a time when a Jew Jewish audience is needed encouragement. And you say, well, if it's written to the Jews, how can it ever uh, affect us? Because so much in the book of Hebrews is, it is really encouragement for the Christian today. Whether you're a Christian, you know, a couple thousand years ago, or a Christian a thousand years ago, or a Christian today, or a Christian in the future, um, this book can be of encouragement to us. It's good to know several things about God. It's good to know several things about Jesus. It's good to know several things about his priesthood. And we see that through the book of Hebrews. We see in Hebrews chapter 1, and verse 1, the, the matchless opening to Hebrews. Now this opening will go all the way to chapter 2 and verse 4, and, and it pictures Christ in his divine nature and glory. He is superior to the angels and the prophets of the ages past. Cons consequently, one who, who neglects the great salvation offered through the Son will, will find himself in everlasting destruction. We'll see that in the book of Hebrews. In fact, underlying design of the whole trustee of Hebrews is to show that the new covenant towers above and takes the place of the old covenant. So if we look at the old covenant, we'll call that most of that the Old Testament. And, and so the, he, the book of Hebrews is really showing us how we kind of take the old and put it out of the way and put the new in. And, and, and if you're used to the old, sometimes it's hard to get used to the new. If you're used to doing things a certain way, and now someone asks you to do something differently, it takes a little bit for you to get used to them doing it differently. And you say, well, why do I have to do it differently? I've been doing it this way for all my life. And so looking at people who grew up in the Jewish faith and Christ asked them to really do it differently, some of them were set back a little bit and said, well, you know, why do we have to do things differently now? And so they started to, to adjust and started to do things differently. And as they began to live their Christian lives and follow Christ, then there came a time where they began to, what we call, slip backwards. And say, well, I remember the, sometimes people would call it the good old days where we did it like they used to. And to begin to say, well, why don't we do it like we used to? Why have things changed so much? And so the book of Hebrews is really to show why we do it the new covenant way. Well, why there is such a difference in, in, in God and in Christ and how much better, if you will, Christ is, how much superior Christ is to, to anything of the old. The great book begins by declaring the greatest simple fact of divine revelation. God spoke. God has spoken to man through his word in the Bible throughout his son, Jesus. And this truth lies at the very heart of faith. It is encouraging to, to our spirits to know that, that God speaks to us. In our day and time, we have different copies. I was debating on, I, I memorized much of the book of Hebrews and I memorized it in the New King James Version, I believe. Some versions, uh, some books I've memorized in different versions. So I was trying to remember which Bible to preach out of, and I believe I memorized it. So I, you know, I'm picking from a couple of different Bibles back there. We have many sources, don't we? Many different versions, many, many different copies of those versions we can pick. And, and so all we have to do is pick up a copy, or we can have one electronically. I also was looking at the electronic version of the New American Standard and, and seeing how that verse plays out. And, 
and so we can look at, we have many sources in our day and age where it doesn't take much for us to look at God's word and for us to see God speaking to us. Now, now many times it's, it, it's, it's very much like, well, yes, that is God's word. Yes, God is speaking. No, God is not speaking to me. God must be speaking to someone over there because he, he couldn't be talking to me. No, God is speaking to each and every one of us. Various times and in various ways. So long ago, in past times, we have the new, in the King James Version, the, the phrase literally means times of old and ancient times. We might think of this, this two-word phrase in the description of the entire Old Testament period. And we would kind of put all of that behind us and, and say, well, that was long ago. Uh, the Ten Commandments are no longer in effect today. I don't have to worry about them. But then part of us says, well, you know, if, if you read through the Ten Commandments, as we looked at this morning, thou shalt have no other gods before me, Exodus 20 and verse 5. Well, certainly that's in effect today, isn't it? So how can you say that's not in effect when it is in effect? Well, we have to look at which ones really have been copied over more or less in the New Testament, don't we? Matthew, or Jesus would say it best in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus would say, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And so it's not like we take everything that was in the old and wrap it up and, and throw it away, but that, that, that's not the, the conditions there, but we understand that we're under a better covenant, and many of those things are part of that better covenant. We pick out verses like, thou shalt not kill out of the Ten Commandments. Was well, that a commandment today? Is that a sin? Well, certainly. We look at Matthew chapter 5, and we see Jesus repeating that. And he would say, you know, basically, don't even get mad at your brother. Oh, your brother, right? And he goes on with saying, you know, well, you know, in the Old Testament, it, it was cooked up to the point where, you know, I'm going to kill him. I'm so mad. I'm so angry. And the New Testament said, well, wait a minute. Don't, even get, don't get to that point. Back up and don't even get to that point. The Hebrews, we see it's so much better. The Jews did not accept as part of the canon, any book that was written later than Malachi. For example, they rejected the Apocrypha, the books, the extra books that many people would have in their Bible, like the book Maccabees and, and some of the others that you would see in some Bibles. But the Jews re rejected those, and as because of that, that's not part of the, what we call can, the, the canon. And the Old Testament prophets wrote as God directed. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And, and so they really looked for books that were inspired by the Holy Spirit. We say in 2 Peter chapter 1, and verse 20 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Basically, we do that a little bit, don't we, in our day and age? We look at, at Scripture, and, and, and this group might have this interpretation, and this group might have another interpretation, and this group might have third and fourth and fifth. And, and, and Peter says, no, no, in this first, no prophecy of Scripture. It's not private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man. In other words, I don't put my will, or you don't put your will. He says, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. We see in 1 Peter 1, chapter 10 and 11, or 1 Peter 1, 10 and 11, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glories that would follow. So the truth is God spoke in many portions, New American Standard would say, and in many ways when he gave the Old Testament scriptures. He spoke sometimes through the priest. He spoke sometimes through dreams. He spoke sometimes through events that would happen. 
And he also spoke sometimes through history, and sometimes the prophets would write out a message, and sometimes God even spoke through the uh, patrium of the prophets. First Samuel chapter 3 and 1 says that then the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Isn't that interesting? The word of the Lord, they're, they're looking for the word of the Lord through the prophet Samuel. And it was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. Now the phrase that we come up upon in, in verse 2 um, has in these last days. So the verse 1, God who at various times and in various ways or proportions spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. That's Old Testament, isn't it? He, he spoke beginning and, and, and you know, through father rule at the very beginning in Genesis, in, in beginning in Exodus, he spoke through the prophets, Moses and, and, and Elisha and, and, and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and, and all these prophets. He spoke to the people through the prophets. And then we have verse 2 kind of brings it to us, brings it to this time period, as in these last days. Now, these last days means much more than recently. We're talking about the weather. It has not rained in these last days. Was that a true statement? Yes. I don't know. Maybe it's a week or so since it's rained. And we could call that these last days. So our definition in our conversation would be about one week. I don't remember exactly how long it's been, but about, about a week or so. Or it could be a much longer period of time. We could look at this COVID has been going on in, in these last days. And that's about oh, a little bit over a year and a half, I think. And we would consider that these last days. But when we think of these last days, we see in Scripture what these last days really mean. It, you know, it, it implies the beginning of a final age has come. And the apostles of the uh, apostolic writers spoke of in their own time as last days. You see in Acts chapter 2 and verse 17, and it shall come to pass in the last days. Now this is a quote from Joel chapter 2. Joel, a prophet, looking for the future and saying, this will happen when you see this happen in this time slot, in these last days. Now we go on to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we have all things and all kinds of things happening. We have them speaking in tongues and, and with fire and all these things. And then we see this verse quoted, and it will come to pass in these last days. That I will pour out my spirit in all flesh. Well, what do you have there in, in Acts chapter 2? The Holy Spirit being poured out on flesh. Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascends up into heaven at the right hand of God. Acts chapter 2, the church begins to start. And as the church is starting, you see this verse, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. You, sons and daughters, shall prophesy. Young men shall see visions. Old men shall dream dreams. Well, when is that going to happen? In these last days. Well, James would, would say this, gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat you your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure when? In the last days. Well, we, I thought we were talking about the day of Pentecost. And now you see James, the brother of Jesus, a, a, a few years have gone and he's talking about our, our gold and silver rushing and growing. What we see in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, he indeed was... Uh, foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested these last times for you, or these last days for you. Jude chapter 1 and verse 18, we see this, how they told that you would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own godly lusts, or these last days, this last time period. So what can we be talking about in this last time period? Clearly the age which we are now living is the last days. I have heard many people quoting um, Matthew chapter 24, where the wars and rumors of wars and all these things will happen, and they say, these are the last days. Yes, you are right. These are the last days. And I could have said this a thousand years ago. 
that these are the last days. And I could have said that 2,000 years ago, that these are the last days. The question is this, how long will the last days last? They're not the first days. Now, now Adam could, and, and Noah could say, well, these are the first days. But now we're in what we call the last days, and, and, the, and our situation is this. We don't know how long the last days will last. It has been with us since Jesus returned to heaven in Acts chapter 1 and sent back the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. These last days have been spoken of on the day of Pentecost following the resurrection of Jesus Christ and will continue into the second coming of Jesus. And when will they end? They'll end at the second coming of Jesus. So are we living in the last days? Absolutely. So look at our scripture. In these last times, in these last days. Verse 2, in these last days have spoken to us, how by his son. So what's different about this time period? Jesus speaks to everyone. From, from the day of Pentecost to now, to eternity, to, to, to the second coming of Christ through Jesus Christ. So we see in these last days how God talks to us. Voices of the past are shown to be inferior to Jesus. Angels, we see in chapter 1, and verse 4, all the way to chapter 2, verse 18, are inferior to Jesus. Well, Moses, Moses was a great man. He, he, he took the children of Israel uh, out of Egypt and, and began to take them through the promised, you know, over to the promised land. He got stuck wandering with them for about 40 years, but he was a great man. He led the children of Israel. Yes, he was. He was in fear of Jesus. And we see that in chapter 3, verses 1 through chapter 7, chapter 4, verse 7. Well, well, Joshua, you know, the, the word Joshua in, in the original language means Jesus. It's the same. So certainly Joshua was, you know, what a guy he was. You know, we can look at all the achievements of Joshua, but Joshua was inferior to Jesus. And we pick that up in chapter 4, verse 8 through chapter of, through verse 13. Well, Aaron. Aaron the priest and, and, and all the priests that came behind Aaron, the, that line of priests, and, and certainly the high priest, oh, the high priest. And if, if you're a Jew, born a Jew, there's nothing better than the high priest of, uh, of Israel. Certainly, he would compare somewhat to Jesus because Jesus was a priest. No, he's inferior to Jesus. We see that in chapter 4, verse 14, through chapter 7, verse 28. Three chapters is dedicated to how, how Jesus is better than the high priest. Well, we see Jesus is kind of climbing this ladder here of how he's better. See, the author allowed for a human agent that God was the true speaker in the Old Testament. Psalms chapter 95 and verse 7, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture. And isn't that reassuring? You know, Psalms is wonderful to read if if you wake up in the morning and, and you know, maybe we don't get a paper in my house anymore. We just quit doing that about, about five, six years ago because we found it. We were so busy, couldn't read it. But um, I, my neighbor, God bless him, he walks out every morning and, you know, gets his paper, sometimes slippers and pajamas, you know, and goes and reads his paper. And that's that's fine and nothing wrong with that at all. But if you're looking for something to read in the morning, you know, you start with the book of Psalms and you read things like this. He's our God and we are the people of his pastor. And, and that's reassuring, the sheep of his hand. And today, if you'll hear his voice, <laughs> you say, well, how can I hear the voice of God today? I can't, I can't hear him speak, can I? Yes, I, I can hear the voice of God. There's certain voices that makes me shudder, if you will. Now, I'm sure the voice of God, if I actually heard the physical voice of God, and I can read God's word and, and understand his voice and, and hear his voice through his word, and I can put on, you know, in, for my car sometimes I have the CDs where I can put the Bible on and I can hear James Earl Jones and, you know, 
and the Bernardo goes to work, you know, how he does, and, 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 and you know, sounds really good, I can hear, but it doesn't make me shudder, but, you know, I have some CDs, or not CDs, some, some cassette tapes of my father, and some reel-to-reels of my dad, that kind of makes me shudder, because to me, that's a voice of the past. But can you imagine hearing the Lord God, the power of the Lord God, what he, if he could look down to me, you know, he, he said so much to me here, now it's up to me to, to listen to him. Now many times I like to talk, or people like to talk, but we don't, we're not as good as at listening. And God saying, listen, I, I have spoken to you, and this is how I've spoken to you. Look at Matthew chapter 22 and verse 31 and 32. Jesus says, but concerning the resurrection of the dead, you've not read what was spoken to you by God. Or have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Sometimes we think, well, you know, God, this is a, a, an ancient document here. And, you know, well, God bless it. It's not a set there. Don't, don't bother it too much. It's a, it's a document. This is there for our learning. This is there for us to take in. The more of this we get in here, the better off that we'll be. We understand that our God is alive. I love that song, especially when, when, when we're, you know, the church house is full of people. We sing that song. Uh, you know, there is beyond the edge of blue. Yes, there is. Our God is alive when we see him here in Scripture. John chapter 10 and verse 35, that he called them gods. To whom the word of God came, and Scripture cannot be broken. You know, why would we want to take time to study Scripture? Why would we want to take time to memorize Scripture? Why would we want to take that time to, to, to put it as part of our, our life, to, to, to kind of put it into our brain, into our life? Well, there's so many reasons, because it, it will make us a better people. The more we know, the more we understand, and, and we should never take the attitude of, of, well, you know, I just can't understand that. That's too hard for me. The preacher has to explain that to me. Or I can't understand that. Or, no, we, you know, you don't understand a verse. That's okay. Go to the next verse. Go to an easier book. Go to an easier chapter. Find something. There is something in there that we can understand, and, and much of it we can. And what's amazing about the Word of God is, sure, there's a couple passages that might be hard to understand, but most of it is pretty basic that we can all understand and we can apply to our lives. And what if, what if someday we didn't have this to apply to our lives? What if they came knocking on our door and said, listen, you just got to give up all the Bibles. Take them all. Take the electronic ones. They, they don't, you know, they have, a, they have a way to take things off your phone, by the way. I, I found this out. I, mean, I didn't have the program, but other people did. They had a program where they didn't want you to have, and they actually reached out and took it off your phone. They could, they put an app on your phone, they could take an app off your phone. And they did. They had thousands of people. And they said it's no longer available on this platform, is what they say. They could take that Bible right off your phone, and if they come to your house and say, I'm gonna, I gotta go and I'll stay on my front porch. Well, maybe you can do that, maybe you can't, but what if you have, you know, and God would say, I still want you to understand what this is. I still want you to, to, to realize and while we have the abundance, it's kind, of like in, it's kind of like in the Old Testament where they had the abundance of food and storehouses of food. And they had, what, no worries at all, didn't they? They had water, they had food, they had plenty. But what would come? Seven years of famine. Well, they had nothing. The rubber meets the rubber. Where you have to realize, well, what's important now? 
some of these things are, are is it important, you know, is it nice to have a little burnt up? So, yeah, that's not important. But what's important is, is this, that the word of God and God's word lasts forever. And if it's in our mind, in our thoughts, in our heart, it will certainly last forever. It is always applicable and effective. And what the apostles taught did not add to the teachings of Christ. It was what had already been authorized in heaven and was to be counted as from, from being the Lord himself. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 19 and 20 says, but when Jesus says, but when they delivered you up, do not worry about how or what you shall speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speaks, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. I'm talking to them about what they would say, you know. I'll be honest, and Mark's preached several times before, and Brian's preached and, and others and when you get up to say you better have something written down or something in your head or some idea of what you're going to say because um, you know you have to say something and there needs to be some idea of the direction that, that you're going because in our day and time you know you're not going to get up there and say I'm going to wait for the spirit to give me utterance now, if you know the Bible, that might happen to a certain extent because the Bible is the steering force that would give you the utterance. You'd look down at the verse and say, oh, here we go. We can talk about Hebrews chapter 1. But there's some things that we can look at here in Hebrews chapter 1. You see, the, the full revelation of God, his nature, his power and will, it is learned only through Jesus Christ. John 10 and verse 30 says, I and thy father are one. Or Hebrews, excuse me, uh, Matthew 10 and verse 40, he received, who he receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. We see John 10 and verse 30, my, I and my father are one. We see in John chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? This is a, a famous chapter that we read. We begin at verse 1, and it's, we usually see it at sad occasions, or, or, or should be more happy occasions, where Jesus is getting ready to, to go into heaven. He's getting ready to go to the cross. And he knows, he knows where his final destination is. But he's got to go through the cross to get there. And he begins in my, you know, don't be troubled. And in my father's house are many rooms and mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, you know, and he goes through this chapter, he gets down to verse 9. You know, and he begins to have this conversation with Philip. And we call him, you know, Philip's like, oh, wait a minute. You know, I don't know. He says, I've been knowing you so long yet. You don't know, know me, Philip? If you see me, Guess what? You've seen God. That conversation in John chapter 17, Jesus says this, this is eternal life. This is the prayer, of course, that, that John records as he's getting ready to go to the cross and, and, and he understands that, that you know, it's, it's his final hour and, and he's praying to, to God, he's praying to his Father and, and, and it's, it's wonderful the things that we see here in this prayer and it goes to several verses, 20 or so verses. It says, this is eternal life that you may know the, the only true God. Well, was that what we're trying to understand from the book of Hebrews? Yes, we're trying to understand the true God and Jesus Christ. You know, so we're trying to understand Jesus Christ. I've glorified you on the earth. I've finished the work which you've given me to do. All through, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see Jesus. I've come to do the work of the Father. I've come to do the work of the Father. I've come to do the work of the Father. When, when, when Jesus ran off when he was only about 10 years old or so, and, and his parents finally found him, he says, don't you know I must be about my father's business. I've come, and here he says the magic phrase, I, I've finished the work which you've given me to do, Father. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself for the glory which I had with you before the world was. And you see God and, and, and Jesus had that glory before the world was in the Holy Spirit. 
and, and then through sin, and, and, and Jesus had to come and live in the earth where sin is present in the earth. God cannot stand sin. So he's saying, Lord, bring me up to that status back where I was, where there was no sin. Not that he had ever sinned because he didn't. He says, I've manifested your name to men who have given me, who have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have kept your word. What have they kept? What have they kept? Your word. How would they know your word? And you say, well, this wasn't written. When Jesus prayed this prayer, this the, the New Testament wasn't written. It was, it was beginning to be written. But no, you're right. It was the Old Testament. We can look at the Old Testament and see all kinds of prophecies. Isaiah chapter 53 and others about Jesus. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. Church knew that. The Christians knew that. The people of God knew that. For I have given them to the worlds which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I have come forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. And you see, this is why the New Testament was once completed, it was the end of all revelation. And when Christ came, he revealed God to the apostles. After Christ ascended, he, he sent the Holy Spirit to complete the revelation, to confirm the apostles' words through miracles. We look at Mark 16, and they came, they went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying of signs. So miracles and the final revelation go together. When we go back a little further in Mark chapter 16, beginning of verse 15, Jesus would say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is, you know, I'm about to, to die on the cross. I'm about to, to go up into heaven. And, you know, this is your task. This is what I want you to do. I want you to go into the world and preach the gospel. And, and, and here's what it is. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the, he who does not believe will be condemned. These signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up the serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Well, what are the apostles going to have? Here speaking to strictly what the gifts in, in that generation would have, that those gifts of the Holy Spirit. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. They went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. Word. See, God has now spoken to us through His Son, Jesus. Spoken is often used in Hebrew for divine revelation. In Jude 3, it refers to the same concept of faith that was once delivered to the saints. So the closest one can get to God in this life is through His Son, Jesus, the only way to the Father is through the Son. John chapter 14, we'll go to that verse that we looked at. If not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know in the way. I was... Lord, uh, you don't know where you're going now. We know the way. Jesus says, I'm the way. Jesus says, I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 1 Thessalonians 1 8, we'll close. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth. Not only in Macedonia and Archaea, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. How strong is that word? They, they, they heard about the reputation of the church. 
that the reputation of the Ephesus church was just so uh, the church of Thessalonica was so strong that it went out to these other cities and and and, and there was wasn't anything to say because they, they, they saw the power of God. John chapter ten and verse thirty one and thirty thirty three. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered, "Many good works I have shown." Shown for my you from my father, for which of these works do you stone me? You imagine they're trying to stone Jesus here, John chapter 10. The Jews answered him, said, For the good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. You see, they didn't understand, these particular Jews didn't understand that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Maybe at a later date they did. That day they did. Through the Bible, through the book of Hebrews, we can understand that, that God speaks to us through his Son. Jesus is the Son of God. Tonight, if you have not made him part of your life and been baptized into Christ, you have that opportunity tonight, or maybe you need prayers, we'll pray for you. Why don't you come as we stand and as we sing? <laughs> Oh, how sweet will be to meet the Lord when he comes in glory by and by. What a song of praise will be our Lord when he comes in glory by and by. How sweet, how Thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to come and serve you, Lord. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will bless 
This bread, which represents the body of Christ, which is broken on the cross of Calvary for our sins, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will bless those who partake. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's ask a blessing on the cup. Heavenly Father, once again we come before you, praising you and asking you, Heavenly Father, to be with those who are about to partake of the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that was shed for the sins of men. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless this cup and bless those who partake of it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You also have the opportunity to lay by in store. The basket back there on the table. Do that. Anything else before we are dismissed? Allie's not feeling good tonight. That's why she's not here. Remember Allie in her prayer. She's not feeling well. Anything else? Let's go to our Heavenly Father and pray together and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we come before you and ask you, Lord, that you be with us as we strive to serve you. And Heavenly Father, we're ever thankful for your son, Jesus, who came and paid the ultimate price that we had the opportunity for salvation. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would keep that precious gift in our hearts all the days of our lives and seek to become closer to you, Heavenly Father. We pray that you'll be with the sick. We pray, Heavenly Father, you'll be with those who have lost loved ones. We ask you to go with us now, Heavenly Father, and return us again at the next point in time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.